Hello, Ryan here, aka Mac, and welcome. Today, I would like to run through the latest monthly report for the Persistent Universe, as it came with a lot of great details. As always, a huge thank you to all of my patrons and channel members. Thank you so much for all of your support. And if you do appreciate my videos, please do consider subscribing and helping the channel to grow. So let us start with the ship art team. They continued developing the Banu Merchantman's exterior. Significant progress was made towards finalizing the large forms, as well as figuring out some of the finer details, such as the intake design, decorative patterns, and the cargo ramp. The team also progressed with the final art pass on an unannounced vehicle, which should be wrapped up this month, with remaining tasks including polishing before the level of detail and damage pass. I wonder if this is actually referring to the sneaky Anvil Centurion that was snuck into the 317.2 build. That could be what was on the progress tracker as the vehicle coming to a close. Work on the Argo SRV moved into the grey box phase. On the exterior, the team completed the hull, cargo lift and entrance lift and made significant progress on the nacelles and landing gear. And on the inside, grey boxing continued for the cockpit, seat and dashboard. And finally for the team, development of an unannounced ship continued, which is currently in grey box with last month's focus on its landing gear, exterior doors, cockpit, dash and pilot seat. That, I suppose, could be the unannounced fit. Oh god, I don't know. Not a clue about this one. I am hoping for some form of ground salvage vehicle, but we will see. Now for the animation team, the facial animation team worked on the outlaw characters, rescue and transport missions, AI bartenders and player emotes. They also supported Pyro with mocap alongside the narrative team. Very excited to see what these rescue and transport missions are. I'm assuming the transport missions could be these NPC taxi missions that we heard about a little while ago that I think were on the release viewer then removed, but rescue missions will be very nice to coincide with the medical profession. Responding to NPC medical beacons that, you know, they're injured in a cave or somewhere on the planet's surface at a wreck and you've got to go and find them and rescue them. Would love that. Now regarding mocap, the new studio in the new offices in Manchester is progressing well with the trust being completed. The team are currently setting up the cameras, computers and other equipment. Now, for the character art team, they further developed the Frontier outfits and began work on high fashion clothes for Stanton. We've been hearing about these for a little while now. Uh, they also created new outfits for various upcoming events and promotions. Many of these, I assume, are relating to the Foundation Festival and the guide system. Now, for the Arena Commander's feature team, they fixed issues and added quality of life improvements to both Arena Commander and Star Marine. Improvements were also made to the implementation of doors, controllers and elevators, which will result in quicker, more robust setups in both vehicles and stations. Hopefully, a lot of that will just come straight to the PU once it's done. But finally, plans were also kicked off for new maps and gameplay experiences for both Arena Commander and Star Marine. So a lot of potential really to expand on both these game modes, but again, still nothing on Theatres of War. When are we going to see anything on that? I wonder what the latest is. Now, for the community team, it does mention that they have been hard at work planning everything related to CitizenCon and the road to 4.0, which means regular 4.0 related content between now and release, with this content rolling out by way of an info series in September. So, <laughs> roll on September. Sounds like once we get 3.18 into the live servers, which will be around the end of September, then we will start seeing this info series highlighting many aspects of 4.0. Of course, the likelihood of seeing plenty of pyro being a big focus and static server meshing as well. But once it gets to around September time, I think the idea of planning to then roll 4.0 to the Evocati on the PTU, just to kind of get it in their hands towards the end of the year so that they have a lot of time testing it. So it's gonna be quite an exciting end to the year as we should be getting quite a lot of 4.0 content to watch and read. Plus, we may see some leaks from the Evocati, so it's all very exciting. Now, for the character and weapon features team, they worked on longer-term improvements to the personal inventory system based on feedback from recent live releases, with the team saying an often requested feature is the ability to move a large number of items from one inventory to another. So we've added a move or button, which is definitely good news. Other features include being able to interact with items on the floor near the player. Another big win there, rather than having to 
physically pick everything up first before being able to move it into either inventory. So basically you could be stood somewhere and then a radius around you, anything within that vicinity. I suppose it could be at arm's reach, would then be interactable and movable into your inventories. We will also be able to move already equipped items from one inventory to another with some of these features already in larger scale internal testing. So hopefully 318, we'll get that as soon as. Elsewhere, fundamental changes to how actor movement synchronization is handled were completed. This new logic successfully progressed through internal testing, which allowed the team to enable the feature in a limited capacity on the PTU servers. And this identified additional issues for the team to work through. But the goal is to have it enabled across all servers in 3.17.2. And this is, I think, referring to the on-foot desync, which when we first got the PTU with 3.17.2, it was a nightmare. It was probably the worst desync I have seen on foot. And between patch or from patch to patch, it has been improving incrementally. Now, moving on to gameplay features, they worked on the next step for the salvage profession, which involved evaluating the possibilities for the munching mechanic, ship tractor beam, and the salvage grinder. So this is mostly, if not entirely speaking, about salvaging with the Aegis Reclaimer, rather than by hand or using the Vulture, which once tier zero salvage comes in for 318, which is by hand or using the Drake Vulture, it sounds like the Reclaimer salvaging with that claw will be the next evolution. Talking of which, it does say both the Aegis Reclaimer and Drake Vulture's hull scraping feature progressed well, and is currently awaiting elements from the cargo refactor. So quite interesting that they do again specify the reclaimer will have the ability to scrape hulls, as we have seen them hooking this up with the lower reclaimer turret to use the hull scraping system, but they have not officially 100% confirmed that for 318, the reclaimer will be able to do this. I do personally think it is going to happen where when 318 drops, the Drake Vulture and the reclaimer will be able to scrape hulls but it would be nice to get a yes or a no from CIG officially. Uh, also quite interesting to hear that it needs the cargo refactor, likely for when the scraped materials or metals have been gathered and boxed up to be used as repair materials, or of course sold on, having that proper box to move around and hopefully a bigger containers than just the 1 8th SEU boxes. Finally, it says engineering and life support are proceeding well, with the team now able to show all relevant items, rooms, doors, and their corresponding controls and data in an early blockout UI screen. Now, it says the initial interactive elements and the first exchangeable and interactable ship items were added too. Now, this is pretty amazing, and we have an image, in fact, which, as mentioned, is very early and extremely rudimentary, but it does show the room temperature, the CO2 levels, room pressure, and the ability to vent or scrub the atmosphere with toggles between life support, engineering, gravity. This is actually some gameplay that I am one of the most excited for. Having all of these systems on board your ships, having to manage and maintain everything while maybe you're quantum traveling somewhere or adjusting things as you go. I am so happy that this is now progressing properly and I can't wait to use it in our ships space stations, any planetside homes we build will need power, maybe oxygen and so on. So I am ecstatic to hear that that is now progressing well. Now for the vehicle features team, they worked on tasks to ready their systems for the release of persistent streaming, which involved the ongoing refactor of the transit system. So they can simulate train networks when the carriages aren't spawned in or on any machines. The team are also continuing the refactor and redesign for the restricted areas with the team saying, we conducted some play testing and found issues with the UI and user experience side of things, which we're working on now. We've now also set up a whole city using the new system to test out developer tooling, which has been quite successful. So this is very interesting. Over the years, CIG have tried to find a good solution to restricted areas around cities and their landing ports that are kind of easy to understand, safe and protective, but not overly restrictive. But with Star Citizen's landing zones evolving into full-on cities with areas to explore in different districts and so on, having a restricted flight area is becoming more and more necessary. Now, if I were to guess at what I think they would do or preferably should do, I would take the more real world approach where instead of stopping players from flying and landing anywhere or, you know, shooting, which is kind of annoying, uh, but use turrets and missile turrets and use the game to push back, engaging those who enter restricted areas 
and don't leave after giving them a warning maybe. However, I do think it might just be a better, safer idea to say the IFCS system has a program that takes over from the ATC. Not a huge fan of games that take control away from the player, and it's a very difficult issue to solve, but I am intrigued to see what they have come up with. Anyway, moving on, the vehicle features team also worked alongside AI to allow the use of different ship modes, such as the missile operator mode, this, they say, is still in development, but progressing well. Now, I'm not sure if this is referring to either ship computer AI blades, so having a blade that can take control of the missile operator mode, or maybe, and more likely, having an NPC capable of sitting in a chair and using the missile operator mode. We will have to see what they say. Again, I don't know exactly what this is for, but I feel like it might be one or the other. Finally, on the balance side, further tweaks were made to the new ground vehicle handling, while a review and rebalance of fuel use began, which aimed to improve the refueling experience. So great to hear more progress on ground vehicles. Really can't wait for these physics updates to the wheeled vehicles. But it's also interesting to hear that fuel is still getting rebalanced, which we know is going to be needed or very significant when Pyro comes along, as it is a much bigger system than Stanton. Now moving on to the Montreal locations team, it says the Lawville cityscape progressed through the white box phase with the outskirts of Lawville added and placed with the proper scale. With the team saying, with these new outskirts, we now have a better idea of the scale of the new Lawville. Hint, it's bigger. They also validated Lawville's transit system to ensure that it can be modified to fit the city's new layout. It is going to be great seeing this new Lawville. I do expect that they're setting up Lawville now to be greatly expandable with more districts and so forth in the future. Kind of making it slightly modular, perhaps. I would also love to see the planetary nav mesh in use for the small settlement outside of Lawville's walls. Having like a small settlement there with available missions and such would be great. But regardless, it looks like CIG are really beginning to expand on the current cities to make them more like cities, with more locations and points of interest to check out. And I can't wait till we get roads as well, although I don't think they're coming to Lawville, maybe. We'll see. Anyway, finally for the Montreal location team, it says a new crash site containing the 600i and Mercury Star Runner derelicts are approaching white box complete, with the team refining the composition and placement of the two ships to create a compelling settlement that will give a different flavor to the Reclaimer version. These settlements are coming along so quickly. I really hope that this either 600 or Mercury Star Runner settlement is friendly, where you have regular settlers living, providing missions and so on. Montreal are really doing amazing work. And at this rate, these new settlements might even be in 318, if not sooner. I can't imagine sooner. But yeah, 318, I wouldn't be surprised if we see more 600i settlements, Mercury Star Runner settlements, maybe another derelict reclaimer. Oof, they're making good progress. Now, we have a random new team called In-Game Branding from Montreal, whose first task was to revisit all the landing zone signage to make it easier for players to orient themselves, with the team saying, this is an ideal mandate since it is developing a close working collaboration with existing teams. Uh, the philosophy of this team is to listen to the community and leverage every aspect of in-game branding to offer a better experience. So quite interesting, and I wouldn't be surprised if this is also a, a team formed to help with the ongoing initiative to improve the new player experience. So helping new players to navigate landing zones and other areas while we are still waiting on the FPS local area map. Anyway, for the narrative team, they continued to work on new mission archetypes planned for future release, with this team saying, more narratively intense than other missions, it has been an exciting challenge for us to figure out solutions for offering the players a compelling story while ensuring replayability and scalability. So nice to hear them acknowledge the need for replayability with these narrative missions. I have no doubts that they will come up with a solution here, and I'm also a huge fan of the lore, so I look forward to seeing these mission archetypes that they come up with, hopefully tying a lot more of the lore into the missions and uncovering things. Additionally, it says the writers created several scripts and had recording sessions for the Frontier vendors, who will be populating the bars and shops in the more remote corners of the verse, most likely Pyro being what they're talking about here. Uh, it also says these line sets were expanded to include the ability for vendors to offer players jobs 
and missions in prep for when the mechanic becomes available. Now, I'm really happy to hear this. I would love for vendors to just request items from me. You know, oh, if you come across three Morningstar helmets, could you bring them in and I'll give you a good price for them? That kind of stuff. Simple missions, requesting players to do simple tasks, building reputation, maybe getting discounts from them. A bit like Tarkov, in fact. Anyway, last month, the narrative team also conducted reviews of a few upcoming vehicles, with the team meeting with designers and artists to look at each vehicle's smallest details to ensure the law is consistent throughout, with several suggestions for new decals. Now, for the QA team, the embedded locations tester continued to learn the editor and team's workflow to better support them by creating test levels. Last month, the focus was on the room system, with the tools used to create outposts and stations, with regular landing zone checks continuing to ensure they haven't deteriorated. So, likelihood is this QA embedded tester will be creating a test outpost or test space station to help the team work through the difficulties of the room system, so how atmosphere and whatnot will transition between oxygen, gravity, all that kind of stuff, really pushing that engineering career again. Next, we have the Montreal Tools team, who continued rolling out Mighty Bridge to all teams and organized workshops on how to use it. This should actually drastically speed up development in a lot of areas, especially if all the teams are learning it. Uh, the procedural location creation tool is progressing well, with the team expecting to put the first version into the hands of the team soon. Another tool that will mean the distribution of basically all assets across planets are done at a much quicker speed than what they are now. So instead of having to hand place everything, it might be more of a click a button, everything is set up as it was rather than building everything. Uh, in fact, it does talk about it here. So advancements were made to a suite of asset scattering and environmental integration tools. For example, the first prototype will be a tool to create a destruction tail behind crashed spaceships in derelict settlements. So instead of having to do this by hand, which is very time consuming, and it does mention that creating a trail by hand can take an artist around a week, whereas this tool will do it in half a day. So that is much quicker, but also I'm sure the more they use it and the more they can tweak it, it'll probably be even quicker than that. Uh, but they will be able to draw a spline that will automatically create the trail before adjusting a set of variables to make the trail look exactly how they want. Which does mean derelicts, derelict settlements will be able to be placed far quicker and at a far greater quantity too. So the planets are probably going to explode with content and points of interest in the near future, maybe even 318 for Stanton in particular. And it will be quite interesting to see just how populated with content the planets of Pyro are on release. Especially as we heard them saying that they are aiming for around 50 of these colonialism outposts of varying types, and this is just referring to the populated outposts, not derelicts, settlements, caves, rivers, and all the other manner of points of interest. So yeah, when Pyro does come along with all its planets and moons, I feel like there is going to be oh, maybe more stuff to do there than there is in Stanton. Is that possible? I don't know, but I'm definitely excited. And hopefully around September time, we will start hearing more about Pyro with the road to 4.0. Now, for the tech animation team, they continued wrapping up the animation pipeline refactor, which involved creating new rigs and tools and stripping out old code for more elegant and performant solutions. Planning was also done for the coming quarters, and numerous new character heads progressed towards animation support as well. Now, for the Montreal Online Services team, they progress towards the new login flow implementation and are currently fixing the remaining bugs found during QA review. Now, it says this refactor is a necessary step towards the goal of achieving persistent entity streaming, which is the big ticket item that's coming in 3.18. The team also managed to fix the Stream Sniper bug, which is a long-standing exploit that allowed players to obtain another player's location marker despite not being in a party. Now, this is a great fix. Not that it needed the name Stream Sniper bug, because it's a shitty bug for anyone, regardless of whether you're streaming or not but I'm very happy to hear that this is fixed. Basically, you could get called by anyone, and then the minute you either accept or even don't accept the call, I think it'll give a marker for, work for your location. So it's been a big issue for a while. I'm very happy to hear that it's been resolved. 
Now for the engine teams, the physics team made several improvements to Raywald intersections, which now contain a semi-continuous mode to trace against rigid bodies. This makes projectile intersection tests more robust with fast moving ships. And these Raywald intersections were also significantly optimized. This sounds like it's to do with the physical damage system and firing ballistic rounds and how they're interacting with the ships, maybe. Uh, the tiling of dense sign distance fields was introduced and many sign distance field aspects were optimized, plus support for player only collision geometry nodes inside CGFs and CGAs were fixed and extended while work on the new ropes continued. Still no hints into what else rope and rope physics will be used beyond maybe this pulley system in Squadron 42. Oh, I do hope we can use them for climbing and abseiling. That would just be such a fun element of exploration. The Gen 12 transition continued with more passes being ported over, including responsive AA and decal rendering in the forward stage. The processing of scattering queries was reworked and the debug UI was added for them as well. Also, buffer copying of Sunshadow Cascades was ported. The format of the previous HDR frame has been adjusted to be more efficient and the cleanup of the renderer thread began. Whew, there's even more. Uh, the Gen 12 ports of atmosphere and volumetric cloud rendering continued as a generalized processing context and new stages to decouple view dependent resources from the core systems that operate on them have been introduced. Uh, the atmosphere shader code was adjusted to compile well with DXC and SPIRV, not sure what any of this is, plus various improvements were made to prevent concurrency issues when streaming in properties of multiple planets at the same time and relaying them to the atmosphere and cloud rendering systems. Now I don't, I don't know what any of that involves or does, but of course the conversion of the atmosphere, the planetary clouds, volumetric clouds, all of this getting ported to the new renderer is all progress to getting the renderer completed. It was extended a little bit on the progress tracker to August. So there is still a little bit of work left to be done before all of it is converted to Gen 12 and we are free from the legacy renderer code, which in turn should bring some good performance gains. Anyway, for the core engine, entity areas now utilize tags to track what entities or area events send to each other. This actually replaces the hidden hierarchy logic that caused various issues and allows for more efficient code. Work continued on running the entire code base through the include what you see tool, with the goal being to eventually make this tool part of the continuous integration pipeline to keep the code clean. Great idea. Uh, the Entity Component Update Scheduler received updates to avoid iterating component lists when using manual update policies. Work on improving file location continued. That will lead to improved loading times for small files. And finally, the old FPS analytic buckets were replaced with an array-based frame time bucket that allows for more accurate profiling of information. Always appreciate a good quality bucket. Right, next up we have the Montreal Live Tools team who designed a new network operation center module which is dedicated to monitoring and troubleshooting login issues, which is now ready for deployment, which is excellent to hear. I know so many people, many of you on stream say that you are having issues trying to log in. And for a few of these citizens, this has been the case for a while now. So I really hope that this new module will alleviate these issues and allow everyone to just play the game and get in because I can't even imagine what it's like not being able to play. So next we'll move on to the AI content team who said a narrative focused AI designer joined the team and began to improve the current shopkeeper behaviors by extending the variety of voices and dialogue. Now this AI, it says is placeholder until the team finished converting the bartender to support different shop types, including food, clothing and weapons. Basically getting all of the vendors in the game, interacting with the items close to them, with the customers, with yourselves, like what we see with the bartender when it works, but they want that for all vendors. Also, further progress was made on the dynamic conversations. And finally, the AI content team set up the leisure behavior AI to use the Moby Glass from different usables. And upon review, these animations were deemed too generic or unconvincing. So the designers are now undertaking pre-visualization to add more emotion and realism. 
Now for the AI tech animation team, on the subsumption side, multiple tool aspects were upgraded and bugs were fixed to move development into the improvement phase, which is excellent. A new panel was also added to give an advanced selection of parameters when the drop-down menu becomes too large. For the UI team, they worked on the new star map, hooking up quantum travel on contextual menus to make the process more intuitive. Very happy to hear that. They also investigated how to show large-scale space clouds. Oh, I really hope that they can show us this new star map soon. Even a sneak peek on the weekly newsletter. Again, I think they're holding off showing anything until they are at the point where they can do a proper reveal of it and do a dedicated segment for it because it is such a big significant factor in Star Citizen, in the PU now, let alone Squadron and the rest of the game. So yeah, they're probably holding off until they've got it nice and polished, ready to show off. Now, time was also invested into upgrading the underlying systems to work with persistence. They also ported the in-game chat to building blocks as part of the ongoing conversion of the lens and visor. Now, the UI team also worked on new approaches to aspect ratios to make it easier for the developers to set up resizable screens. They also upgraded the new 3D UI card system so that they can easily create layered floating UI with curved surfaces. And this will help create better looking interactive holographic UIs and animated billboards in key areas. I think this 3D UI will look so much better than what we have right now. They try and keep UI relevant and contextual to the location. So if it's a low tech location like Grim Hex, for example, the UI is very flat, boring, simple. If it's somewhere like Microtech, where it's kind of ahead of the game, it'll be a bit more flamboyant, I guess. And I know for MISC ships, they want to use 3D UI. So hopefully this card system will allow for that. Now, finally, we have the visual effects team who worked on several locations last month, including Grim Hex's hospital, several of the derelict reclaimer variants and the derelict outposts. Work was also completed on an upcoming vehicle and salvage effects were further iterated upon. Optimizations were made to planetary ground storm effects, which had caused performance issues for some players due to a change in the planetary data that determines how the effects are spawned. And I actually think there was something to do with the lighting that they disabled in the current 317.2 build so that people get better performance when it is stormy. So hopefully that will have a significant effect. Anyway, that was the monthly report for June. Oh, that is a ton of information there. Some amazing progress being made. I can't even remember what I said because I need a cup of tea. But all of that was an absolute pleasure to read. With that said, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you do appreciate my content, please do consider subscribing and helping the channel to grow. Also, come and hang out over at twitch.tv forward slash supermacbrother. You are all more than welcome. Whether you're new to Star Citizen or a veteran, we have a lot of fun checking out the latest builds, talking about Star Citizen now and in the future. And if you are new and have any questions about the game, the project, about what they're trying to do and what the end game is or the end goal, do stop by and ask them. You are more than welcome to ask as many questions as you have. If you could hit that thumbs up, I would truly appreciate it. And tick that notification bell if you would like to be notified when my videos go live. Again, a big thank you to my patrons and channel members. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.